Uh, first, let me welcome our distinguished speaker uh, this afternoon, Professor Walid Ijazi. He is a professor at uh, professor of business economics and academic director at the Hoffman School of Management, where he regularly teaches uh, Canada's current and future business leaders in the MBA, EMBA, and customer executive programs. He has successfully developed a course in Islamic finance in the MBA program at the University of Toronto, which is the first of such course in Canada. He is also involved in the move to enhance prevalence of Islamic finance in Canada. Professor Hijazi has published about 50 articles in academic peer review journals and has delivered lectures in over 30 countries. He has advised several Canadian and foreign governments on things related to international trade, foreign investment, international tax structures, and global competitiveness. The lecture will be done in English. If anybody needs to have a translation equipment, please raise up your hand. Uh, we have translators, <coughs> simultaneous translation available uh, here. Just raise up your hand and then our staff will be providing you the equipment for the uh, translation. So we are fortunate to have such a distinguished professor to, to be able to spend with us uh, here. Uh, to discuss a very important topic on the potential of Islamic finance in the West. We had a discussion uh, a short while ago before we start the session. Since he comes from, <coughs> from Canada, he will also be telling you about some of the issues related to Islamic finance in Canada as well, apart from the West generally. And as you know, the development of Islamic finance apart from the OIC or IDB member countries we have seen such a growth, uh, high growth rate in UK, particularly in Luxembourg and a few other countries. Um, but uh, we know that there are some development in North America and, and these developments, uh, for, for I'm sure, some of us are not able to follow in detail. And um, Prof Hijazi, being somebody from there, will be able to share uh, his experience uh, in, in research, in teaching, in consultancy in that part of the world. And, and he's also been uh, very familiar in this part of the world. He has been coming regularly uh, to give lectures to institutions, uh, including universities. So given that experience that he had in Islamic finance, in, in finance generally, so we are fortunate that he has agreed to spend some time with us. As you know, the lecture is not only within this hall. We also have this uh, webcasting, which is simultaneously done. And we have audience in Russia, Central Asia, in Southeast Asia and a few other countries. So again, uh, please uh, bear with us in the context that we had some technical issues at the beginning because we have to move from a different to a different room to this room. But Alhamdulillah, I think the, the, now we are set. The lecture will take about 40 minutes and subsequently there will be a question and answer session. I would like also uh, to get uh, the Ahmad Jibali to be chairing the session because I will not be attending for the I have another meeting in a short while. Uh, Brother Ahmad Jibali is also a student of Professor Hijazi. Okay, so uh, uh, student, hopefully you are not examining the professor, <laughs> but more or less to facilitate the discussion and, and to, en to enrich the discussion. So with that introduction, I would now like to call upon Professor Hijazi to share his thoughts on this important topic. Thank you very much, Professor, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's it's my great honor to be here today. I think it's yes. Okay. It's my great honor to be here today uh, to talk to you about um, the potential for Islamic finance uh, in Canada. Just uh, for a little bit more context, I will be here in the Gulf, so I'll be visiting uh, five of the six Gulf countries in the next month. Um, so after today, I will go to Medina. Uh, to give some lectures there, and then I'll be in, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, Oman, and Qatar, also giving lectures, but also having meetings as well. Um, and as a professor at the University of Toronto, so Toronto is Canada's oldest university and very, very conservative. And we started a course in Islamic finance at the University of Toronto. I did, and, and uh, Brother Ahmed Gabeli, he helped me uh, tremendously in bringing lots of expertise and helping structure the course, so I should call you the co-professor of the course as well. Um, but the, the, the course is now a regular offering in the MBA program, and that is something very big, 
because it's the only university in Canada to have a course in Islamic finance. And the dean of the business school that allowed it, once he finished his term as dean, there were many professors that tried to stop the course because they said, we have a course in Islamic finance. Why? We don't need it. And uh, so that's why it's very, very important for us to continue to um, work hard to make sure this course is a success. But another activity that I'm doing as well, with the help of Ahmed and others, is trying to enhance the profile of the Middle East for the Rotman School of Management. Everybody in this room has heard of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And if you think about the universities in North America, that's all they think about. And I'm very disappointed that there wasn't more thought at these universities about the Middle East and about the Muslim world. So in addition to this course in Islamic finance, we are doing lots and lots and lots of activities on bringing an understanding of the Middle East, of the Muslim world, to the business school. And that's why in two weeks I will have a class of MBA students from the Rotman School meet me in Dubai and they will be part of the meetings that we will have in order to enhance the profile of the Middle East. Now one question you might ask, why did I not bring the MBA students to Jeddah? And the answer is too difficult to get visas for them. Okay. All right, okay. So uh, this is a busy slide, but what I'm, what I'm going to talk about uh, today, in 40 minutes or less, is you know, the world Muslim population. We, we know that the population is about uh, a billion and a half people, but where is it located and what is the prediction for the Muslim populations in the West particularly? They don't want to talk about the potential for Islamic finance, but I think this is the most important point to make today is the potential for Islamic finance is not simply among Muslims. It's also among non-Muslims as well. And that's sort of a very, very important point to make. And also I want to talk about the retail side, so personal mortgages, personal RSPs and investments, versus the, uh, the commercial side, where you think about Sukuk and project finance and so on. Um, and I think that's sort of put that in your mind as where the growth is going to be and where the potential is. I'll talk about the push by Dubai to be the center of Islamic finance and then the push by the UK uh, to be the center of Islamic finance in the West. And you notice when I have for the UK I put the word push because the UK has gone a long way, already issued the first Western sovereign sukuk and I have the desire by Canada and I'll, I'll focus some of my comments near the end on developments in Canada. Okay? and what the challenges are, are within Canada. Then I'll talk about what are some obstacles. What are the obstacles for further growth of Islamic finance in the West? Are they real in terms of tax treatment? Is it legislation? Is it political? Or is it backlash on the part of, of, in, uh, of, of the public in terms of being afraid of this term called Islamic? And this is sort of something that's quite important in the West. And the last point I want to make, and again, when you ask people in the West, what is Islamic finance? What do you think the answer is? No interest. So everybody thinks you borrow money for free. Okay? And you don't, of course. Everybody understands that there's a cost uh, when you do a, a murabaha or mushadaka. However you finance a, a mortgage, there will be a cost. And usually on the commercial side, sukuk are benchmarked off of LIBOR. Mortgages are benchmarked off of local interest rates. In the end, Islamic finance will only be sustainable and grow to a proportionate level if it's competitive. So in the long term, if Islamic finance is not competitive, it will not survive at the level that it should. And so that's sort of high level uh, outlook of what I'm going to talk about today. So the world's Muslim population if you go back to 1950, we were less than 20%. We're now about 25%. I understand there are many PhDs in the room. If you do a linear projection, how long before these two lines cross? I should point at someone and make you give me the answer. Okay, how long before they cross? If you just do a linear projection, and the answer? 
100 years from now. Okay? In 100 years, if the population trends continue as they are, Muslim and non-Muslim populations in the world will be equal. Okay? But if you look at this, um, in 2010, 23% of the world's population was Muslim. In 2030, it's 26%. But if you look where I have the red downward arrow, you can see that the growth rate of the populations are slowing. The growth rates are slowing, where from 1990 to 2010, the population growth was 2%, 2.2, and over the next 20 years, it's estimated to be 1.5%. And in 2030, there will be 79 countries in the world that have a million or more Muslims. Okay? But one thing that we have to understand about Muslim populations, what are the main drivers of population growth? It's education, income per capita, government policy. So when you take all of these things into account, we know that the rate, the rate of growth of Muslim population in the world will slow as countries further develop their education and income per capita improves and so on. So this is the world's population distribution of Muslims around the world. You can see in North America, about three and a half million people are Muslim. In South America, it's about less than a million. In Europe, it's 43 million. And of course, the Middle East and North Africa, 317 million. But Asia is about a billion people uh, in the world from from Asia that are that are Muslim. So that's the distribution. But now let's focus by country. If you look, uh, the gold is 1990 number, the blue is 2010, and the pink or red is 2030. And you can see that um, across all of these Western countries, which country in 2030 will have the largest number of Muslims? And you can see that's France, where in 2030 it's estimated it will have 7 million Muslims followed by the UK, uh, the United States, the UK, and Germany. Uh, Canada currently, had, currently has about a million Muslims, and that's estimated to grow to 3 million. Canada, that, that, that's where I'm from. So this is Muslim population in terms of numbers, and you can see how Muslim populations are spreading across the Western world. The next slide is going to be as a percentage of the population. This is as a percentage of the population. Now, this slide is hard to read, so I'm going to... I'm going to change and I'm just going to rank these by percentage of the population in 2030. So that's the same slide, but you can see which country in the West in 2030 is going to have the largest percentage of its population that is Muslim. And you can see that's France at 10%, Belgium at 10%, Sweden at 10%. And look at the far right, which country is going to have the smallest share the United States, even though the United States will have among the largest number as a share of the population, the United States is going to be quite small. And of course, there's Canada, where it's estimated that the population that will be Muslim in 2030 uh, will be about 7%. So rapid growth of Muslim populations across all of these Western markets. I want to point out also, if you look at the UK, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, you see dramatic, dramatic growth rates. So a big spread of Muslim populations around the world. Okay, so that's as a background. Now, you look at Islamic finance, and it's growing 50%, and I know many of you have seen these numbers, 50% faster than conventional banking. You know, just if you step back and think for a minute, 25% of the world's population is Muslim, but only 2% of the world's financial assets are Sharia compliant. So I think a good question for you just to sit and ask is the following. If 25% of the world's population is Muslim, and only 2% of the world's assets are Sharia compliant, then that tells you what the potential is. Maybe we shouldn't be thinking about population, because even though 25% of the world's population is Muslim, only 10% of the world's economy is from Muslim countries, from the OIC. But in any event, whether it's 10% or 25%, in the long run, what do we think Sharia compliant assets should be? Should they be 25%? Should they be higher? Should they be lower? Here's a, an interesting quote from a former governor of the Bank of Canada. He said, in a quote, when we exit the financial crisis, so the world went into a big financial crisis, he said, when we exit the financial crisis, Western financial systems will look more Sharia compliant than they did before. And what did he mean by that? What he meant was, what he meant was that when we come out of the financial crisis, our financial systems will be much more conservative much less reckless. 
And as it turns out, Sharia compliance is exactly that. So as it turns out, Sharia compliant banking has been described by many people in the West as back to basics banking, sort of where it's asset based, shared risks and partnerships, where a lot of the excesses that you saw that led up to the global financial crisis, um, that, just, that, that just can't occur. So everybody I think has seen this picture, the rapid growth of Islamic finance globally, the estimates for 2018. So well, currently, there's about $2 trillion worth of assets that are Sharia compliant. That's expected to be $3.5 trillion in 2018. Just a rapid, rapid growth of Islamic finance. But just the S&P 500, the S&P 500, that's $1.9 trillion. So if you just think for one second about that, one index in the United States, and it's a big part of the U.S. economy, but one index is $2 trillion. And that's half of the world's Sharia compliant assets. But I have one question. Does anyone know how many S&P stocks are Sharia compliant? Yes? More than half. More than half. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you. Okay. Of course, that's a different measure of, uh, of, uh, of Sharia. So I'll talk in, in a bit about the board for the S&P. But one thing to think about is many of the shares on the S&P are Sharia compliant and people don't even know it. And these assets are not part of that three and a half. When you look at that three and a half trillion dollars, the assets that are Sharia compliant on the S&P are not counted. But there's one fundamental difference. There's a fundamental difference. When I talk about the three and a half trillion dollars worth of assets that are Sharia compliant, these are Sharia compliant by design. They are designed to be Sharia compliant. When you look at the S&P 500, these shares are not Sharia compliant by design. They just turn out to be Sharia compliant after the fact. So a big project that we're, we're working on right now, and I'll, I'll allude to it at the very end, is really around what is it about companies that are Sharia compliant by, des, by default, not by design, and how do they differ from Sharia compliant stocks that are, that are Sharia uh, by design, and I'll come back to that. Okay, so the IMF did a study and they attribute the growth of Islamic finance to three factors. The three factors, one, the increasing number of Muslims in Western markets, I've already talked about that a little, the growing oil wealth in the OPEC Islamic countries, and third and most fundamentally, and that's why I put it in red, is the attractiveness of Sharia compliant financial securities um, and the fact that non-Muslims are increasing looking for Sharia solutions. And as we know, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, those assets that were Sharia compliant, financial institutions that were Sharia compliant, they actually performed better than those that were not. And that's drawn a lot of attention from Western policymakers and so on. So if we look at the wealth that's accumulated in the West, these are just enormous amounts of number where you look at the sovereign wealth funds um, in in um, in the GCC, there's one here from, from Algeria, but these are the world's largest sovereign wealth funds domiciled in Islamic countries. And you look here, this is two, three, four trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. And many Western countries want access to these funds. So when you think about the infrastructure deficits in the West, if you look at the United Kingdom, if you look at the United States and Canada, there's, uh, tr there's five trillion dollars worth of unmet infrastructure demands and these governments are looking for new sources of capital and this is one place that they're looking for new sources of capital and the view is that if we can structure these in a Sharia compliant way so Sukuk or something like that we can actually tap into a lot of this wealth so now you think about Dubai and many people here when you hear Dubai you don't necessarily put Islamic with it okay but in the West when you talk about Dubai, everybody thinks of Dubai as the center of Islamic finance in the world. That's that's the perception. Yes. Maybe on the point that uh, the West would require uh, to structure Sharia compliant products to access the sovereign wealth fund. Because as far as I know, that most of the sovereign wealth funds in the region are purely conventional investment vehicles. They don't really, most of them don't care. About <laughs> most of them do not care at all, yeah. at all, and um, but some do. 
And uh, I totally agree with you. If you think, for example, I'm visiting Adia next week, I don't want to say they don't care, but it's not top priority. But you, you are right. Um, in order to access that capital, it doesn't have to be Sharia compliant. However, all of the interactions we've had with the key banks in Canada that have been uh, interacting with the sovereign wealth funds in the Gulf, Sharia compliance is one attractive additional feature. I do know Adia has investments in the banks in Canada. They're not Sharia compliant. I also did an informal survey of at least 50 business people in Dubai. And if you look at Sheikh Zayed Road, what percentage of those developments would you guess are Sharia compliant? 20%. So I, I, I take your point exactly, uh, but the question becomes, what is that additional feature that can allow Canada to be more attractive than others or the UK? So the question is, why would the UK, there's a question for you, why would they offer a sovereign sukuk? And the reason is there's lots of investors, including sovereign wealth funds, that do not put zero weight on Shadia complaints. They don't put 100% weight, but it's not zero. On the private sector, it's very different. For example, in Saudi and the Gulf, yeah. the, most of the investment banks would really care about uh, the Sharia compliance. But just uh, my point, we're just in the sovereign money, uh, mostly yeah. conventional. Yeah. But, but yeah. sorry, and I think let's let's move on to the lecture. Yes. Okay. But I, I'm going to continue. But I will add, and if you talk to the people in the sovereign wealth funds as well, one of the reasons that they're not looking at Sharia is they want to be competitive depend on their measure of it. And as it turns out in the West, there's just not enough Sharia assets, there's not liquid assets available. Do you think that's going to change? I would argue it's going to. I would argue okay, in time. Okay, so we know in, in, in Dubai, and again, this comment about, about um, uh, um, Dubai being the center of Islamic finance, you know, if you look at what's happened in Dubai, it's quite remarkable. If you look at Dubai, only 2% only 2% of the Dubai economy is based off of oil, whereas in Abu Dhabi it's 80%. But in Dubai it's only 2%. And you look at the development that's happened in Dubai, it's absolutely remarkable if you think about the rise of Dubai. And it's driven by the, the vision and the leadership. And now they've got a big push to become the center of the global economy. And um, um, this big announcement for Dubai to be both a center of the Islamic and conventional economies living side by side, um, and they also now want to have a push to be a sustainable and green economy. If you, we know that in the GCC, if you look at um, uh, CO2 emissions per capita, the GCC is among the highest in the world. We know that if you become more sustainable, that means, means less um, competitiveness. But there's something, and this is me in a different suit, but the same tie. Okay, that was a joke. Uh, giving a talk uh, in Dubai, um, and um, this is trying to launch Dubai as a center of Islamic finance in the world. And we couched it in what's called an integrative thinking framework. And the idea is, and my push, how I personally have pushed Islamic finance in Canada, is this concept of integrative thinking. So when you think about integrative thinking, what is it? Usually when managers make a decision, they make a decision based on their training. I was trained in this way. That's the solution I bring to the table. And we do that without even knowing it. So if you look at all of the psychological studies of how managers and government officials make their decision, they bring their training and their background to making that decision. What is integrative thinking? It says rather than taking this option or that option or a combination, let's step back and think of a way to have positive elements of both and come up with a unified way to move forward that satisfies or allows you to get the benefits of each of the alternatives before you. And so what I've argued in Canada, what I've argued in front of the Canadian government, is that Islamic finance should be welcomed in Canada because rather than conventional or Sharia compliant, we could have both. And there's room for both, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little more, but I couched it in an integrative thinking framework. So if you think about, uh, Ernst & Young did a big report and I think this is smack on. In order to have Islamic finance grow in the West, this is what we need. These are the three most important criteria, knowledge and human capital. 
Because if we start an Islamic bank in Canada and there isn't people that know what a murabaha is, or there isn't people that know what a fatwa is, then how can you have sort of a, a, a depth of offerings of or financial institutions across the country? So that's why the course in Islamic finance at the Rotman School is working to fill this void. We put over 300 people through training, so a basic understanding of Islamic finance, regulatory clarity, very important, which I'll come back to in a second. And the third one, of course, is responsible innovation. And we can talk at length about you know, whether or not financial instruments that are Sharia compliant, whether they're Sharia compliant according to the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. And that's why there's a very influential paper, Are Sharia Compliant Assets Really Sharia Compliant? It's a, a Journal of Economics and Business paper, really well-read paper across, with academics, and it really is, it raises skepticism to say it's not really Sharia compliant. They just fix it so it looks Sharia compliant, but it's not really. So that's why this whole issue of responsible innovation is so important. Okay, So we've had extensive discussions on sovereign sukuk. So just to be clear, the difference between a sukuk and a sovereign sukuk, a sovereign sukuk is a sukuk issued by governments, and in Canada, there's big, big pushback because if you have a sovereign sukuk, that means you have to take state assets and put them into the special purpose vehicle that would be subject to uh, the sukuk. And many governments do not want that in the West. Many people in the West, when they hear the word Sharia or Islamic, they say we, you know, they, they push back from that. That's why there's a big discussion in the West about should we call it Islamic finance or should we call it ethical investing or responsible investing. And the reason the banks will not do that, why does anyone think that a bank would not want to call Islamic finance ethical? Because that means everything else they do? Absolutely. Okay. Um, because that means everything else they're doing is unethical. Okay. So this is now a big challenge, but um, I, I just want to pause and just tell one story. I gave a talk to 100 government officials. And I asked them the question. I said, when is the last time anybody in this room ate a meal that was halal? Two hands went up. And then I asked them, I said, did you eat in the cafeteria in the building today in Ottawa? And many of them said yes. And I said, guess what? You ate halal. And I said, you didn't know. And they didn't know. And I said, it doesn't matter. I said, how many of you have Sharia compliant assets in your portfolio? And two hands went up. And I said, if anybody has the S&P, which everybody does in one way or the other, you all have halal or Sharia compliant assets in your portfolio. And so the point that I'm trying to make to them is not that different. It's not that different. And that's the way we're trying to market this, is to say, it's not that different. In fact, a lot of what you do today is Sharia compliant, and you don't know. But many people um, get their backs up. Um, one of my students um, met with the Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper. And the Canadian government sponsored the world's largest Islamic finance conference in Bahrain in 2013. I'll show you a picture in a second. And Stephen Harper who's not a friend of the Muslim world. My student had an audience with the Prime Minister and thanked him and congratulated him on the Canadian government's support and sponsorship of this Islamic finance conference. What do you think the Prime Minister's response was? I don't know much about Islamic finance, but we really have to worry about national security. <laughs> That's the background. That's the background. So that's it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not going to show this video, and we'll make these slides available, but I encourage everybody to watch this video. You know, many of you may not know this, but do you, what is the largest food chain in the world, fast food? Subway. Subway. And Subway is halal in the UK. Many of these chains are going halal, and the reason they're going halal is there's no cost. You don't lose. You don't lose Christian customers because they don't know. What, what, if you eat a if you eat a chicken sandwich and it's halal, it doesn't matter. But you gain Muslim consumers. 
but I want you to watch this video to see how many in the Republican Party in the United States don't like that. And you can see if you watch that video. Okay. So this is the conference. This is the conference that we that the Canadian government sponsored in Bahrain. Over 1,200 delegates. The Canadian government sponsored it. Paid a lot of money. Okay. That's me on the right. On the very left is Canada's ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Then there's Janet Ecker, a former minister of finance from Canada. And then uh, Jeffrey Graham, a lawyer who does lots of work in Islamic finance. And we gave a talk at this conference, and the room was, was full, and there were people standing, and it was selling Canada as a place for Sharia-compliant uh, investing. So while we were there, we met with CEOs and senior officials at more than 10 banks, Islamic banks, to talk about the, the, the benefit of investing in Canada. So many of you may not know a lot about Canada, but according to the World Economic Forum, we've had the number one ranked financial system six years in a row. The Financial Times wrote in the aftermath of the financial crisis, so the financial crisis started in 2008, the Financial Times wrote, financial crisis may skip Canada. Okay, we have fantastic. What do you think the very first question was after we gave our talk? Well, there was one question about education, but the very first substantive question was, is Canada open to Islamic finance? Is Canada open? Because these sovereign wealth funds and these pools of capital, it's a big world. Why would they come to Canada? Canada's 25 to 3% of the world economy. Is Canada open? Because if I go invest in Canada, is Canada going to welcome me? Okay. This gentleman, Najib Sawiris, one of Egypt's richest men, invested in Canada. And if you watch this video, he said it was the biggest mistake he made. And the reason he said, and he invested in telecom. And he withdrew now from his investment because when he went to Canada to invest in telecom, all of the promises that were made, all of the promise, the government did not live up to them. So he said it was a big mistake. So when I was at, when we were at the conference here, everyone said, if we invest in Canada, is Canada open? And that's why when you look at the three points the IMF made, human capital, responsible innovation, and regulatory clarity. If we invest in Canada, they said, will Canada be open? And this is a long speech. This is the foreign minister of Canada. This is the government that's not been the most friendly to the Muslim world. This is an excerpt from his speech. He talks about the pools of capital in the West. Again, I have another lecture, but um, Canada in the UAE just signed an agreement where the UAE will spend up to $2 billion, invest up to $2 billion in Canada, and they want a pillar of that to be Islamic finance. If you look at this whole discussion in these interactions, if you look at what's in red, this is the Foreign Minister of Canada trying to provide regulatory clarity in the Canadian context. He says Islamic finance is welcome in Canada. So governments in the West are trying to embrace, embrace Islamic finance. The major reason, I would argue, is to get access to Middle Eastern capital, to capital in the Western world. But at the same time, the attractive features of Sharia compliant structures, the fact that they fared so well in, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, is an added dimension where many businesses are very much interested in that. Okay? This is a course that I started in Islamic finance. So this is the university newspaper. I started a course in Islamic finance. I should say we because Ahmed helped so much. But I take the credit because I'm the professor. Okay? In the article, what did they write? In the article, this is an article they interviewed me on the university newspaper about Islamic finance to congratulate me on creating a course. And what do they write? They say five years ago, Ontario rejected Sharia courts because in Canada, in Ontario, there was a push by the Muslim community to have decisions around divorce and other types of civil issues within the family to be resolved within a Sharia court. It's a big, big issue in Canada. And, and that's the way they start the article. So everybody associates Islamic finance and Sharia. It's, 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 it's a, definitely a challenge. Okay, here's a question. So in Canada, you can get beef, 
or you can get halal. Which do you think is more expensive? Halal. halal. Here's my question. How much should a Muslim have to pay to get halal? Suppose you want to buy one kilo of beef. If it's not halal, let's say it costs one dollar. If it is halal, let's say it's ten dollars. How much should a Muslim have to pay before he has to eat halal? Obviously, if he can't afford, what do you do if he can't feed his family? So the question is, what is the difference? So fortunately, the premium between halal and not halal is only about 5 to 10 percent. So most Muslims, they can buy halal and it's okay. But let me ask you this when it comes to a mortgage. Let's say you're a Muslim and you want a Sharia compliant mortgage and there isn't one. Should you be able to buy a home with a conventional mortgage? It's a big debate. In Canada, you can get a Sharia compliant mortgage. In fact, we have 40 years of history of Sharia compliant mortgages in Canada. But there's a two to three year waiting list and the premium is three, four percent. So if you get a conventional mortgage and you get a Sharia compliant mortgage, you're going to pay three to four percent more for the Sharia compliant mortgage. Here's my question. How much should a Muslim have to pay premium and still, still not haram? So I pulled my MBA students and I asked the Muslims in the class. So in the class, about 25% about of the students are Muslim, the rest are not. And I asked them the question, how much of a premium, how much more relative to the conventional before you say khalas, I won't do Sharia compliant, I'll do conventional. What do you think the answer was? One basis point. So I told the person, I said, uh, I said something, I won't repeat it here. That's haram. That's, the question is, what is the point? I don't know the answer. But that's something that each Muslim has to deal with. But I think it's so unfair that so many Muslims in Canada have to make that decision. They either do not buy a home or they pay quite a premium. That's the debate. Okay? So, um, this go on, okay? There's a gentleman named Khalid Sultan, a former student of mine as well, who actually works for one of Canada's biggest banks. It's called CIBC, and he offers halal solutions. So if you go, this is a conventional bank. When he comes to speak to our MBA students, we always ask him the question, you're working at a bank, it's haram. It's all interest. And he, he, he appeals to a fatwa that says, it's okay because I don't want to be impoverished. This is the job I have, but I should try to find another job. But because CIBC, Am I speaking with good face? Is that good? Okay. Um, because um, CIBC, because his bank allowed him to do this beautiful thing, so all of the customers that come to his bank, he actually creates Sharia solutions for them. Okay. Now, this is an uncomfortable conversation, but this is a bank called UM Financial. They got $50 million from a credit union to create Sharia mortgages. And 300 families in, in, in Ontario had Sharia mortgages from this bank called UM Financial. So UM Financial, United Muslims. And because of liquidity problems, because the credit union pulled the $50 million, of, of, he had to close it down. But not before taking two to four million dollars, according to the newspaper, of, of, of the company's money and buying gold. And what did he do with gold? He gave it to, he claims he gave it to someone in a parking lot, a gentleman he doesn't know, for scholar fees, because they were the scholars, and the money disappeared. So that's why they, they charged him with fraud, and he's now before the courts. But you know what this has done to the cause of Islamic finance? It has really, really hurt it. So he actually came and spoke to the students. It's a big, big challenge, but this has really, really, really um, hurt our ability to move Islamic finance forward in Canada. But that's why you always say two steps forward, one step back. Maybe this was two steps back, but it's difficult. Okay? So um, the UK, as we know, the UK, and again, 
why do, why is the UK? I know there's a distinction between sovereign wealth funds and private money, um, but in, in any event, the UK is just has a sovereign sukuk. Um, the the city of Toronto is discussing the sovereign sukuk. One of the big challenges with the city of Toronto is at a city level or the municipal level, there's laws against governments pledging assets in that way, but that's clearly not the case at the federal level. But if you look at the the profit rate is, is on this uh, sukuk, it's 2.036%. The other thing that's quite interesting here, this is a 200 million pound sukuk, but how much was the demand? What were the orders for it? 2.3 billion. That tells you the demand. The demand is absolutely incredible. You know, and this is, you know, one question I have, which I'd like people to think about, is you think about the UK and David Cameron's push, and I underlined, you know, he wants to be, and again, I asked, I mentioned this point before about Dubai and Islamic, but listen to David Cameron. He said, we want the UK to be a center for Islamic finance alongside Dubai and Kuala Lumpur. Big, big push. That's clearly a push to challenge centers in, in the Muslim world. But, you know, one, one point I want you to think about is all these sukuks, what are they benchmarked off of? If you look at the yield or the cost of a sukuk, what are they benchmarked off of? Fiber. Why isn't there an Islamic index? Well, because there is not a well-developed, highly liquid, risk-free environment where one has emerged. What do you think is going to happen in the UK if they are successful? If the UK is successful at creating a hub for the issuance of sukuks, especially sovereign sukuks, there may, there may be an index that comes out of the UK that would serve as the benchmark for Islamic bonds. Now, I, I make me very, very happy because the West would have embraced Islamic finance. It make me very happy. But I would much prefer that that index be in the Muslim country. But having said that, it's better to have one in the UK than not, than not have one at all. Okay? These are the number of Islamic banks by country. And if you look at the UK is leading the Western world at 22. Um, and if you look all the way down, Canada has only one. And if you look at the very beginning of my, of my presentation, I made the point that the push by the UK and the desire by Canada, because the UK has really pushed, Canada has not. Okay? Um, um, so I'm just going to go here. Now, I'm just now going to talk for a few minutes. I have just about less than five minutes, but work that, um, that Ahmed Gabeli is leading in some work we're doing together with the, uh, with the Rotman School. I should ask Ahmed to, to, to give this part of the talk, but I know it's my job today, next time. But uh, if, if you look at liquidity, um, um, you know, there, there, there are big, big challenges with the growth of Islamic finance globally, in the Muslim world, in the West on two dimensions, there are many others, governance and so on, but one has to do with liquidity and the fact that there isn't highly developed liquid, uh, liquid sukuk markets, there isn't the availability of, of, of liquid assets that can be used by banks and sort of their reserve requirements and so on. So basically what this is, is this is simply by region, if you look at the financial institutions that are in each of these respective regions, what are the total assets that they account for? And if you look at Australia, it's $10 million because there's one financial institution. And if you get Asia, it's $343 billion. And if you look at the far right, that's going to be the liquid assets. So these are measures that we've created. And then this here is at the regional level. This one here is at the country level. A lot of data. What I would love to get from the Islamic Development Bank today is the underlying data. I'm not leaving till I get it. Nothing. Okay? But what I would love to get is the following, is data at the bank level. So if you look here, Australia has only one bank, but Bahrain has like 50. It would be fantastic to get the data at the individual bank level to do this analysis. But here's the question. If you look at the, the assets, the return on equity, the return on assets, and liquidity, what you find, this is just a, a lot of our results, but essentially what you find, what you find, and again, I skipped over some of the results, but what you find is return on assets, return on equity, are significantly and negatively related to liquidity. In other words, um, um, when companies have more and more liquidity, their ROE or ROA goes down. That's kind of expected. But what's really important is for the development, the further development of liquid sukuk markets, 
or Sharia compliant um, securities. Um, and I, I skipped over this, but when you look at the UK, who was so, so excited about the government issuing a sovereign sukuk or all of these businesses in the UK and these banks, and they have 22 banks, because they'll have, ass they'll have access to Sharia compliant sukuk, sovereign sukuk that are rated and so on. It's really, really beneficial to the growth of Islamic finance. I have another doctoral student named Fadid who's actually looking not at liquidity per se, but what he's looking at is um, uh, risk management within Islamic banks. Um, and there's lots of challenges there, but uh, I won't talk about that. If you look at the data, again, this is from the Ernst & Young report. You look at the 20 leading Islamic banks, the, uh, the return on equity is 12%. So you have comparable conventional banks at 15%, which means going forward, what's most important, what's most important here going forward is the quality of growth, not just growth per se, but quality. Now, I'm just going to jump forward, and now I just want to very quickly talk about a study that we're doing at the University of Toronto. There are something on the order of 200 or 220, 220 S&P stocks that are Sharia compliant, according to the filter used by S&P. And for example, we know, we know for example, that uh, alcohol and pork are haram. But if you look at a company like American Airlines, whose main business model is transportation, but if you're on a flight, you can get alcohol, you can get a pork sandwich. So should that company be excluded? So according to S&P, they have the 5% rule. As long as the haram activities do not exceed 5%, as long as the haram activities don't exceed 5%, it's halal. And it's a debate, but that's, that's it. And there's lots of other, uh, other conditions, and they're bored. But here's, here are, the, here are the, 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 the key results I, I want to stress. It varies by industry. What share of the S&P is Sharia compliant? by industry and you can see what you see from here when it comes to financials there are very few Islamic financial institutions in the US so we look at the red one at the very bottom only less than 10 percent of US financials are Sharia compliant but if you look at a lot of others they are Apple computer Sharia compliant not by design by default by the business model so I have lots of slides I'm going to do two slides this one if you look at the S&P and you look at Sharia compliant over 2000 to 2012, of course, the analysis must be done more carefully and more rigorously. But here's the key. Here's the key result. The key result is the following. If you were to restrict your investment universe only to Sharia compliant assets, so let's say you went to the S&P and you want to invest in the entire index or you wanted to restrict your investment only to those stocks that are Sharia compliant, there's no discount that you have to take. That is a very powerful result because usually you might think that if you restricted yourself to Sharia compliant, you have to take a hit on your return. But again, one has to be careful because those companies in the US that are Sharia by default are not necessarily comparable to those that are Sharia by design. If you're a Sharia by default, you have a much better business model and therefore a better company in contrast to those that are Sharia, are Sharia by, by design. And I just skipped over all of these and just to say the, I know there's lots here, but the very last, the data support on average, Sharia compliant outperformed or at least did not underperform um, conventional stocks. I think that's a very powerful result. But again, I want to stress, comparing companies that are Sharia compliant by default is not the same as comparing companies that are Sharia compliant by design, and that's our current research. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Walid uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation, which is uh, I've been also uh, exposed to a new data and new information, which is. Uh, new for me since I'm away a little bit from you these days. So uh, I'd like to thank you again and we'll open the uh, questions and we will have uh, questions from the room here and also we'll receive questions over the email from uh, our uh, uh, colleagues uh, attending the webcast. So questions? Uh, my name is Dawood Ashraf and I'm a researcher in
Thomas, do you have uh, any questions? I have questions. Yes. Hi, my name is Daoud Ashraf and I'm a researcher at uh, Islamic Research and Training Institute. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first question is about uh, the bank in uh, the openness of Canadian government for the Islamic finance. Unfortunately, the experience that I have personally there, uh, there was a Saudi group, they were trying to establish a bank in Canada since 2006. And uh, the way they went through, I had the opportunity to meet with the, with, with, with the group, the, the, the whole people, and uh, it was like, it's, it's a horror story. So I don't think so. Uh, the Canada is open for the, uh, for the Islamic finance per se. The only thing that I see, that there is a credit union there now, that is the ICIU, uh, trade union, but that's not a bank. Uh, second thing, you 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 basically hit the nail, uh, hit right on the head of the nail that the Western countries are looking for the Middle Eastern money. So there is no motivation for Islamic finance per se for the Islamic finance. This is only to grab that money and increase their their their, their growth. So that's that's number one thing that I want to have your comment on. So what what's your take on it? The second thing is, uh, as, as you have mentioned, uh, that uh, most of the uh, stocks that we have, uh, whether it's on FTSE 350, uh, Europe 350, S&P Japan, TSX 60, or KPSNP 500, uh, I have done a couple of papers on it, and we have picked up the equity level data. And our uh, idea is more than 40% equities are Sharia compliant, mm -hmm. and in some cases, the Sharia compliant equities are more in Western indices than in GCC. So, uh, but that even does not give us uh, that this will enhance the investment in Islamic finance. So again, uh, I ask you to, 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 to help me understand that although the number of equities by design are compliant, but how this could help to improve the Islamic finance in, in, in the Western world. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Um, I went back to this slide because in the middle it says push by the UK and I put desire by Canada. And maybe I should not have even put desire, but the reason I put the word desire is one has to be, first of all, I agree with you that the horror stories, I've been involved in many interactions with the federal government and uh, they're not so friendly to Islamic finance. I agree. Okay. At the same time, there are only seven tier one banks in Canada. What does that mean? That in Canada, one of the reasons why Canada is ranked number one in the world for six years in the world by world, by world economic forum on the soundness of our banking system is we have a very high bar. In other words, it's difficult for anyone to have a bank in Canada, let alone a Sharia compliant bank. So there I'm just giving some credit to the, the government in Canada. But having said that, I agree with you and I know there's there's been a gentleman who has had all of the papers signed. He just needs one last step before mobilizing to have an Islamic fund and he's been waiting since 2006. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and is it dishonest? In other words, are these Western countries only embracing Islamic finance or Sharia to get access to this capital? I would argue yes and no. I would argue absolutely yes. But at the same time, here's what I would argue. I would argue, I would take a different spin on your comment on the equities. You find 40% or a large share of equities are Sharia compliant. I take that as a benefit. Here's what, here, this is the reason why. I had a gentleman come to me at the University of Toronto four years ago, and he was offered $200 million worth of investment. They have a group of comp companies in Canada, including car dealerships and others. They were offered $200 million of investment from Abu Dhabi, but it had to be Sharia compliant. You know what his question for me was? 
jokingly, he said, Professor, if I accept this money, do I have to grow a beard? But his point, his point was well taken. His point was, do I have to change? And if we can point to the fact, if we could point to the fact that 40% of equities are already Sharia compliant, maybe not on the same filter, but they're already Sharia compliant, I believe that the platform is there for an explosion of Islamic finance in the West once we get over a critical. I think what we have to be able to better demonstrate is the business model, is how do Sharia compliant assets perform over the long term, not just in terms of return, but in terms of volatility, especially in, 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 in the case of a financial crisis. So I'm actually more positive. I like your comment. I, I hadn't thought of that before, but the comment that, that these equities that are Sharia compliant have a bigger prevalence in the West than, than they're not listed in, in, in the East. I think that's a, a, a fantastic point that may be more integration of financial markets. But I'm actually very positive on the growth of Islamic finance in, in the West. I believe, okay, if that's the reason Western countries want to embrace it, is to get access to Middle Eastern capital, so be it. But I also believe that as we have more Islamic finance in Canada, the average Muslim will have access to Sharia compliant solutions. You know how much it hurts when people come to me and they, they ask me, and I, who am I to answer this? But they ask me, Professor, there's a four-year waiting list to get a mortgage, a Sharia compliant mortgage in Mississauga. Can I get a conventional one? Is it haram? And people have to make these decisions. So I believe as Islamic finance does grow in the West, it doesn't matter what the motivation is. As long as it grows, it will benefit the average Muslim, I believe. Uh, if you allow me, uh, Professor, I would like, uh, from my, my humble experience, just to comment also on your questions, uh, Doctor, because it's very important <laughs> questions, and I would like to share my experience in that especially. The bank that you are talking about and the, uh, the visibility study has been uh, uh, proposed to the official there for establishing an Islamic bank, it's a tons of paper. I went through the, the study, the visibility study still, still. But honestly speaking, the quality of the visibility study has been developed and proposed. It wasn't at that level that can be accepted in the Western and especially in the Canadian system. It's uh, talking about something which is not understood by people there and there is no clarity in many things which is unknown. So people, it's not easy in a conservative uh, market to accept such a models without understanding what's there. This is number one. Number two, Western, they are not looking for Middle East money. No, they are looking for the quality of business model and the value added inside and the, the social responsibility, which is under or bagged, bagged our, our transactions. The real, real value, value added and economic value added. So this is what they are looking for. But they are not looking for the word is Islamic, is it Sharia or non-Sharia. This is non, non, not, not in their interest. But they are interested to have quality, quality of business model, quality of assets, adding value to their economies. So thank you very much. Brother uh, uh, Wasim. Thank you. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, so this one uh, question, I would like to have your views on whether the animosity in the West towards the words Islamic uh, finance or Sharia as such could be lowered by using the word participative finance or you know, rose is a rose by any other name. So if you name it participative finance, would that make any difference yeah. in your views? You know, I, thank, thank, you, thank you for that question. We actually had a round table at the University of Toronto exactly on that question. Should we call it participatory? Should we call it responsible? Should we call it alternative? The consensus of people around the room, although it's a debate, but the consensus for people around the room was to call it Sharia or Islamic. That was the consensus for people and they thought it was more effective to try to communicate to people that by its Islamic finance it's not that different than what you currently have because already many of what we what we do is already Islamic and really try to get people to have an understanding of what it means to be Sharia compliant. But, you know, that's a hard question to which it's difficult to answer. I, at early on, when I first started thinking about Islamic finance, I started thinking about ethical 
but many of the people in Toronto involved in the Islamic finance community, they believe we should call it Islamic finance or Sharia finance and work to enhance the understanding of what that means. That's the consensus of the people. Uh, we'll take this uh, question. Yeah, please. Go then, I Go the next. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hijazi. I think this is, was very useful and very insightful and rich presentation that will give us more insight into Islamic finance. I'm Canadian as well, and I went to school into a uh, poor university, not to, to UFT, but near UFT called Waterloo. That's a great university. Yes. That, that's I, a great university. But I see also some of other, your other students here in the audience. In the audience. Anyway, they will have invited themselves to get up. I have one question. There was, uh, you talked about mortgaging in Canada, and I think there was one entity uh, you know, that's using Islamic mortgaging you know, house that have problems. Yeah. Uh, it went to belly up or it's still it's plunging. I don't know. It, I, I'm sure it had a problem. So can you comment on that? What happened to this entity? or? What's the future of having something similar to that? Okay. That's a, um, I think this, this is maybe what you mean. Yes, this is a UM financial, so UM, United Muslims. Um, when Omar Kaler started this, this bank to offer Islamic mortgages, um, you should see the media impact. Oh my God, it was unbelievable. We had someone visit us from Michigan. There's an Islamic bank in northern Michigan called University Bank. And University Bank opened the week after 9-11. And the CEO, his name is Stephen Rainsand, came, came to Rotman. And here's what he told us. He said, we opened one week after 9-11. And he said he got phone calls from 20 senators and congressmen, Republican and Democrat, thanking him saying because, and this is the, what I have in the box, when you have Muslims over there and everybody else over there, there's no integration. So things can happen. When you have everybody integrated, you have common understanding of each other's culture. I would love for Muslims in Canada not to have to go over there to get a mortgage. I would like them to be able to go to the regular bank, TD Bank, RBC, See, I would like them to go to a regular financial institution, not a small other one. So when University Bank opened in Michigan, the congressman thanked Stephen Ranzen for opening it because it allows for integration. When Omar Kaler opened UM Financial, lots of excitement. Most, there's a lineup. I, I saw one number. There were 1,000 families, 1,000 families waiting for mortgages. And you get a mortgage from him. It was halal. It was Sharia compliant. Then what happened, and again, I'm not the authority on this case. This is something that's before the courts. But according to the media, something between two and $4,000 was taken from the company, and they bought gold. And they gave the gold to someone with no receipt, no nothing. So the company said, where's the money? And he argued that he gave it to the Sharia scholars. But he left. He went to Dubai and there was a warrant for his arrest. Now, this really, really hurt the name of Islamic finance because even Muslims, even Muslims say, you know, it's all the same. You just package it differently. And look at when we do get an Islamic mortgage, look what they did to us. What Omar Kaler argued in my class, he came to my class just two months ago, he argued that because the credit union, the financer that gave him the $50 million to do the mortgages, they pulled that money. So the credit union took the money, so he had to liquidate, and everything went bad. But the truth is, I mean, I don't know the truth because it's before the courts, but one big point that comes out of this, one point that comes out of this, there's a lack of capital. There's a lack of capital in Canada, in the U.S., to finance Islamic mortgages, and when I was in Bahrain and I met with the CEO and senior managers in 10 financial institutions, encouraging them to invest in Canada, you know what they said to me? They said, why should we, if your Canadian banks will not, why should we? But the, the reason, and it comes back to the point made earlier 
by Dr. Daoud is, is that there are many regulatory restrictions in Canada. For example, for example, the Bank Act will not allow a Canadian bank to own title of a home. So any structure that you had when the bank has to have some stake in the asset, not allowed. So there's lots of challenges. There are ways to get over it, but unfortunately, it's not all good. I hope I answered your question. Do you have an answer? Uh, any questions? Here? We have a question. Uh, could you please comment on withdrawal of uh, Islamic products by HSBC from the, its Western business? Yeah, uh, that, that 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 again. Uh, uh, when I mentioned one foot forward, two steps back. And HSBC, which had a Sharia compliant window for many, many years, and the fact that they withdrew, it actually it could be one of one of two things, but I think it may just speak to the challenges. And if, if there's one quote I had in this presentation with that which I think is, is very, very important, is the following. In order for Islamic finance to remain relevant over the long term, it has to be competitive. End of story. So, again, you know better than me, but how many people are going to invest in a Sharia compliant asset if its returns are lower than conventional? I don't know the answer. We know the sovereign wealth funds will not, um, but we also know that some other sovereign wealth funds actually do have a social dimension to their analysis, and if they believe investing in Sharia finance, will allow for the development of the industry, then there, there may be more interest in that. But I, I just think it speaks to one of two things. One, it speaks to um, the difficulty Islamic finance. I, I, I showed you the returns, the return on equity for Islamic banks. It's lower than for conventional. That's important. The other one, which I think is, which has to be mentioned, is Goldman Sachs, when they tried to issue a Sukuk a few years ago, and then they withdrew it and they reissued it. But many, not just governments, but many Western companies like Goldman Sachs say, wow, there's all this money. Let me just do something, call it a sukuk. And, but the markets push back because there were guarantees that it would be truly should be a complaint. Uh, we have uh, three questions here, uh, four questions. Uh, so we'll start uh, with your answer, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Mulan. I'm on the uh, Islamic Island Development Program. On your last slide, be sure. Yeah, sorry. On your last slide, you show the performance of the Sharia compliant. You show the Sharia compliant by and you show a 12 year period, which are was from 2000 And we understand from 2012, uh, the market got affected with two crises, 2001, 2008. But if we extend the horizon going back, you know, maybe another 20, 30 years, would you expect to see the same cloud performance or would you expect to see something different? That, that's a PhD question. That's a great question. So um, what we're currently doing is actually I just purchased from S&P the data to go to 2014. So I can update it, but I can't get it going back further. And the reason is I did not go through the filters. But how do you know if a company has more or less than 5% of its revenue in Haram Industries? So that was done by S&P and they did it all the way back to 2000. They don't have it before then. But more fundamentally in the research that we're doing now, which relates to the work that you've done, but we're actually looking at doing case studies to say, for the companies on the S&P that are Sharia compliant, what is systematically different about their business model? Is it just random that they're Sharia compliant or is there something systematic in their business model which speaks to uh, uh, Ahmed's point about quality? And if you can show that companies that are Sharia compliant or have much better quality in whatever way, then what we can do is we can then go back, it's an indirect test, go back in time and say the companies that had these better quality characteristics I don't know if they were Sharia compliant, but I can go back in time to do an, an exercise to say, do companies that have those characteristics do better over a long period of time? 
but that's a PhD thesis that maybe, inshallah, you will do. Okay? We'll uh, have the questions here. Thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting uh, lecture. And my, uh, I have one on the one question. I think you have said many times, but my question goes to what I have never also said, you know, the Korean experience, and now we are going to the region. The, 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 the likelihood this system will succeed, the basic thing is the Hayuma capital. I think everything else, you know, is coming. You have people who can do the job and understand. What are you noticing, you know? The young people, the environment. You know, when, when you look this, we're talking, you know, here, the government is at a high level. But when the grassroots, you know, is their interest for the, for the system? Yeah. Um, Based on your experience. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that question. In Canada, and I would argue in the United States even more, grassroots, there's no appetite for Islamic finance because people don't understand what it means. And many people, you know, many people think that if we bring Islamic finance to the West, it's the first step to bringing Sharia. And it scares people. It scares people. If you look at MBA students and people in business, they're educated. They know. They're not afraid of Islam. They're not afraid. So all of the people at the university, you talk to them, they understand. Educated people. For them, when they, that's why my class, our class, okay? But that's why the class this year, it's full with a waiting list. With a waiting list. That's unbelievable. Why are people taking the class? Because it gives them an alternative way to think about a problem. And notwithstanding the point about sovereign wealth funds, the Canadian banks, the Canadian finan the pension funds, you know, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is $120 billion. And who's their number one target they want to talk to? Adia. And who are they hiring? They're hiring students that know portfolio manage, asset management, but they're hiring people that understand Islamic finance. Because when you're sitting and talking to people, even if you're not going to do a Sharia compliant uh, transaction, knowing what it is matters. So one story I will say, I have a student, Jewish student. He was at a bank and the issue of a sukuk came up. Someone raised sukuk at the bank and the, um, the nobody knew what it was. The managing director said, it's an Islamic bond, but I don't know what it is. My student on the whiteboard described it. And everybody in the room said, that's all it is? That's all it is? And he said, yeah, that's it. So uh, uh, so coming to your point, I would argue, when you look at it, the business case, the business case for Islamic finance is clear at that level, at the business community, 100%. Embracing it, 100%. Even with the government, we believe our prediction is Islamic finance is growing, notwithstanding the government's obstacles to it. Why? Because of the business case. But grassroots, I'd see it's a problem. We'll have uh, two questions, the last two questions here. You can, you can uh, go ahead without uh, the microphone. Yes. Yeah. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hizazi. It's a pleasure to see you again. You were my professor 18 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was a great speech and, and a lecture. My question is two parts. The first is, uh, what would you say to a critic in the West who would say and argue that Islamic finance is a minority in, its, in, in the Muslim majority countries? So why would you expect it to succeed in the West? Mm -hmm. Because the majority of banks in Muslim countries are conventional banks. The second part of the question is, do you think there is a, uh, an innovation challenge in Islamic finance and banking? Uh, in other words, there is a mismatch between the legal Sharia um, theory and the finance practice. Mm. Um, you have many Muslim you know, uh, scholars all over the world who know Islam very well and can issue fatwas about, um, about uh, finance issues. <coughs> But when it comes to the knowledge of finance, we have to still rely on the conventional finance. Mm -hmm. We go back to 
uh, conventional plan. So what we do is just we put a kind of abaya on conventional products, basically. So what do you say to that? Thank you. Yeah. Um. Let's see. We will take the, the, the last questions also here. Uh, here with Blaza Hassan. Yep. Also, and we will answer the two questions. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Professor. It's really wonderful uh, information that we have received. In fact, in my, uh, I have not seen such a wonderful uh, presentation about Islamic finance in the West. I have two questions. One is for personally for me, and secondly for generally for IDB. What do you think, what is the role of IDB or what IDB can do to propagate Islamic finance and banking in West specifically and maybe in Canada? And secondly, last night my daughter, she was going to London and she's doing law over there and she was discussing with me the elective subjects she has to select for, for her law graduation and one of them is Islamic finance mm -hmm. and next year she's going to Canada. Do you think that I should recommend her to go and select this Islamic finance project because she has to do a career over there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know where to start, okay? <laughs> but in terms of a, a critic of Islamic finance in the West, uh, my argument would be, um, they. I would argue S&P 500, if you have that in your mutual fund, in your retirement savings, or the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange, same thing you already have Sharia compliant assets. So why are you worried? It's not that different. There's a famous speech. Most conflicts in the world, people focus on differences across different communities. But if I take two communities and I count the similarities, there's far more similarities than differences. But people focus on the differences. Okay? I would argue it's not that different and often people that fear Islamic finance are conflating it with Islam and with problems in the world. I would argue that Muslims are part of the Western community. I showed you the populations and I'd say why does it bother anyone if my name is Walid, I want to have a, a mortgage that's Sharia compliant, I want to eat food that's halal, I should be able to go to the bank, get a mortgage that's halal, the bank should make money, I should get my mortgage but not be impoverished. And why does it hurt anybody? That's why the key term for Canada, multiculturalism. Where people, as long as I don't hurt you, you don't hurt me, you can do what you want. That's John Stuart Mill. Okay? So that my, my, my response would be, don't conflate Islamic finance with the world's issues. That's the first point. The second one is a very important, and the example I always come up with is Tawaruch where you think about, I go to the bank, I borrow $100, one year later I pay back 110 It's a riba, it's haram. But I can take two murabahas back to back, stack them on top of one another, and get the same thing. So it's sharia compliant according to the letter of the law, but not the spirit. So it's got an abaya on it, as you put it. That is a big challenge, I agree. And when you have people pushing too much, that's when you, you lose your deen. You lose because it just becomes about money and not about, as Ahmed keeps talking, the social conscious. So that's a big challenge. But it comes back to the other point, and it relates to the sovereign wealth funds as well. How old is Islamic finance in its modern form? Yeah, what is the first Islamic bank in the, in this, in, in, in the last, where, where was it? Egypt in 1963. That's 50 years. So Islam, Islamic, Islamic finance is still going through all these growing pains. It's not old. It's very, very recent. And it's emerged in a part of the world that's not well developed. It takes time. So as, P, as Islamic finance grows and becomes a, a more robust, more well developed, we won't need to rely on Western economic models only. Okay? One interesting academic question. I, I don't know. Just try to get this academic question. <laughs> Imagine if we could redo history and Islam was much more developed today and Christianity was not. And we had Islamic finance as the world's financial system, not conventional finance. So imagine if Islamic finance developed first. And here we are today. Imagine if Islamic finance was the world economy 
and conventional finance was only 2%. My question for you is, would the Sharia compliant financial instruments look like the conventional ones today? So the reason that's an important point, it's an important point is we should not be too tough on Islam. You shouldn't say that Islamic finance is replicating conventional. And the reason is that that's maybe, the, maybe it's the optimal form. And even if conventional finance wasn't there, Islamic finance would have moved there anyway. But that I don't know. That, that, that's a, another PhD question for you as well, okay? Okay, so is it within Abeya? I don't know. Okay? Now, when it comes to um, the role of the IDB, I think the IDB can play an enormous role. I, I look at, for example, in Canada, uh, we need help in actually creating a robust conversation across the whole economy uh, in terms of bringing academics, having conferences, having consultations with government, um, and we really need um, human capital, we need people, we need financial resources to help bring the case to the government. It, it's not easy, and for your daughter, I, I would encourage her to do that course in Islamic finance, because if you look at the data, I mean, if you just simply, if you just simply look at the growth rates for Islamic finance, I have to go back 50 slides, but if you look at the um, That slide, look at it. Islamic finance, and particularly with a law degree, particularly with a law degree, Islamic finance is becoming more and more important. And one of the criticisms of Islamic finance in its development form is legal costs are very, very high. Because, I mean, we're getting more and more standardized when you come to these structures because they become more prevalent. But the lawyers make a lot of money and your, wife, your daughter can get a piece of that. So I encourage you. Okay? Uh, uh, thank you very much again uh, for uh, Professor Rodi. Uh, one of the uh, uh, stories that I'd like to share uh, also with you, since, uh, mashallah, we, uh, we received a lot of questions about the Western, and especially in Canada. Uh, my first uh, lecture in Rotman School of Management for Islamic Finance, uh, Professor Walid, when he introduced me to almost a 37 student, MBA student, and he told me, uh, Ahmed, you have one hour and a half lecture, and at 3 o'clock you have to give 20, 20 minutes break for the student. So he came back like uh, uh, 3, uh, 10, and he found that everybody inside. So he knocked the door and he came inside and say, no break. Say, everybody refused to take a break. And he will, he was asking to good more. So we finished at that, at that time almost after two hours and a half. So this is to show you how people they have an interest and they have passion to know more about Islamic finance. Although there are none Muslims or there is only a couple of a few Muslim students there, but the rest they was very active to know and very you know uh, uh, looking for Islamic finance and what to know more about Islamic finance. And at the end of the course. Uh, uh, seven groups uh, uh, came with seven study uh, about how to adopt Islamic finance in Canada, and they came with different models. And there was a judge, a judge uh, a panel, uh, and it was an amazing. You know, after a very short course, the quality and the output that I received, we received from the student, which is they never have any idea about Islamic finance. They came and they produced a quality of, of documents which is I didn't see from people they used to work with me for almost more than 10 years in the Islamic finance industry, qualified. So this shows the potential and the needs and the value of Islamic finance when it goes to people they understand the real value of Islamic finance. This is one of the things. The other things which I'd like to share also about the number of licensed banks and tier one banks, seven banks in Canada. Canada uh, has been licensed 25 licenses doing different activity in, in banking, but seven is uh, what we call it full-fledged uh, banks, which is tier one. Uh, I had a chance to meet with uh, people from the regulatory, uh, regulatory body there, which is called OSCE, so I was asking the same questions, why we don't allow to establish a new Islamic bank? The, the answer was saying that we never say to the existing bank not to perform Islamic finance, Islamic mortgage, and we will welcome that that banks can do that. Or people can come and buy license and they can show us a valid business models and we will approve it, but within our 
current platform because we don't want to expand more. So the opportunity there, the potential there, but are we capable and are we ready to be able to work and to expand and to maintain the Islamic finance plus in such economies or not? So the questions, if you are talking about IDB role and other roles from here, I think we have to model ourselves to be able to talk the same language of the Western, to be able to convince them about that we are able to do that within the system because you have a very advanced system comparing to our systems here. So I'd like to thank you again and thank you for your uh, being here and uh, for your participations and thank you again for Professor Walid being here and we enjoyed and we hope inshallah to receive him uh, another time and several times inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you.